Hello, and welcome to the lecture series on the Age of Enlightenment here at Learning the Social Sciences. The Renaissance led to the Scientific Revolution, and the Scientific Revolution led to the Enlightenment. If scientists could understand the physical world, then certainly they could help to understand human experience. When looking at the scientific revolution and the enlightenment, we can see how they did not immediately start quickly from one day to another. We cannot sit there and say Nicholas Copernicus is the start of the revolution, nor can we say a particular work from Voltaire, Locke, or Hobbes started the enlightenment. However, we do know that there is an era where we start to have new light and new revolutions coming out in the field of science. And then we start having this era of new reasons and new experimentation in terms of thought coming out. Now, there are going to be some individuals that kind of help move in between the two eras. If you look at Isaac Newton, somebody who is a great with the scientific revolution, his work contributed to the power of the human mind, and he helped push people to really jump into philosophy. He encouraged natural philosophers to approach nature and science directly. And of course, he insisted on the use, use of the scientific method, something that sociologists and psychologists both use today. Now, during this time period, we have a growth in knowledge. A large part of the scientific revolution was making the sciences accessible to the masses. And we start having some of the writers of the era write books that people could understand. Let me tell you one thing, Newton was not the greatest at that. Principia, well, it kind of confused a lot of people because they had to figure out how to do calculus before they could figure out all the other things. But we do have some people that write books like Dialogues and others so that more than just the high-end realm of the scientists or natural philosophers or later on the philosophers will understand what is going on. Now, another thing that is happening that is going to spur on the Enlightenment is we have this skepticism over religion because of all of the wars of religion, those French Civil Wars, the Thirty Years' War, and so on and so forth. And with this, people are kind of going, well, so far religion has been kind of our moral compass. Is there something else that maybe we should be looking at? And that is where we start having like the ideas of Locke come out. Now, Locke, believed in the tabula rasa, that everybody was born as a blank slate. He was 100% nurture over nature, and that knowledge comes to us through our five senses and as we age. Now, he is also somebody who is going to be an influential philosopher who helped shape the American governmental system. He's also the antithesis to Thomas Hobbes, and his Leviathan or absolute leader that is kind of just a necessity. Hobbes going on the side that we need an absolute leader while Locke is on the side of, hey, we can start to have a say in the government. So for Locke, he said that humans can take charge of their own destiny because humans possess free will. They should be prepared to handle their freedom. Obedience to one's country should be out of conviction, not out of fear. And so that whole divine right of kings where you cannot question authority, no, he's not going for that. He is saying you can question authority. So in terms of the philosophy of John Locke, legislators owe their power to a contract with the people. There must be a benefit to be the governed. Neither kings nor wealth are divinely ordained. And when the government ceases to benefit the public, then the governed can withdraw their consent. They can say no more. We are not going for this. And so the right to government rests with the governed. And then he goes on to say that people have certain natural rights that were endowed by God for everyone. And with that, he comes up with life, liberty, and property. Now, if you're from the United States, you know that we are going to take that phrase and make a minor adjustment. We are going to have life, liberty, and prosperity. 
Now, with John Locke, revolution is legitimate when the governor has become a tyrant. As he stated, when the governor, however entitled, makes not the law, but his will, the rule, and his commands and actions are not directed to the properties of his people, but the satisfaction of his own ambitions, revenge, covetousness, or any other irregular passion. For him, that is when he says, you can rise up. Now, of course, he has different books on different topics. He has his Letter on Toleration, which he published in 1689. Uh, he has the book that we really use in the United States to form our Constitution, Two Treaties of Government, written in uh, 1690. Some Thoughts Concerning Education in 1693, and The Reasonableness of Christianity in 1695. And of course, he has other publications and essays that he has written, but those are the big ones. And thinking about publications, that is what is going to really help spur on the Age of Enlightenment. We are going to be able to have books coming out of everywhere, and we are going to have a growing readership, so much so that we are going to have people now get famous and well known simply because of their writing and they're going to live off of their money that they are making just by writing. Alexander Pope and Voltaire are going to be two big examples of this during the Enlightenment era. We are also going to have the growth of public opinion because we're having newspapers and we're going to be having, well, other people making their newspapers and editorials and other things. And so people are going to be questioning what is going on in their country, in their home, in their workplace. And the government is now going to have to answer to the people. Well, in certain countries, we already have parliamentary systems or a republic like the Netherlands where the government is already having to respond to kind of the people. And I'm kind of saying kind of because, well, it's not really open yet for the masses for voting and there's other issues, but we have some say of the people in the government. But absolutist nations now are going to have to try to figure out what are they going to do. And some of them are going to start banning specific publications. We have then the rise also of the philosophers and the salons. Salons were informal gatherings of philosophers to exchange and debate about specific ideas. Traditionally, women would take part and organize many of these salons so that they could actually happen. No, this is not a place where you're going to go and get a haircut. This is a place that you are going to discuss topics of the day, philosophy, morals, even economics when Adam Smith goes and visits Paris. So a lot of different things are going to be on the table for you to talk about. And we are going to have various people get involved. Of course, somebody who's going to get involved in that is an individual named Voltaire, the first philosopher. That's just a coined phrase. Now, he is somebody who is going to also publish a lot. And in some of his publications, he's going to tick off some people, some individuals or, well, all of France. Um, so he's going to spend some on again, off again time um, in the Bastille, which is a fortress and a prison in Paris until he eventually goes into exile in England. And then, well, kind of couch surfs his way through Europe, visiting a whole bunch of different monarchs and well-established individuals. He also, though, is going to write a long list of books that are really going to resonate with the people of Europe. In 1733, he wrote the letters on the English, which praised the British for what they had done in terms of freedom and liberty. And then he criticized the French and ended up in the Bastille. Um, in 1738, he went and published the elements of the philosophy of Newton, which helped to popularize the theories of Isaac Newton. However, he is going to go out and write a specific work in 1759, which is going to be satire, attacking war, religious persecution, and unwarranted optimism about the human condition. Um, Candid is going to be that book that is really going to kind of just shove philosophy in the face of Europe and kind of say, hey, look at these issues. 
And Voltaire, he is somebody who is just a prolific writer and who has so much wit as he goes and does it. Politically, he was a proponent of the enlightened despots of the era, the people that still had this absolute power, but were using their absolute power to make change. For example, Frederick the Great of Prussia and Catherine the Great of Russia, two individuals where we will talk about in another lecture series. Religiously, he is a deist. A deist is somebody who believes that God is this clockmaker who went and created the clock, wound it up, put it into motion, and then simply walked away. And so for them, there is no, nothing like a miracle. And for them, they see the universe as being governed by natural law, not a specific personal God. That is how they are going to be looking at that. Now, of course, there's going to be other people besides just Voltaire coming out and bringing in change. We have David Hume who goes and writes the inquiry into human nature, uh, where he says that there's no empirical evidence that miracles exist. Uh, we are going to have Edward Gibbons, who is a historian, but one who is, you know, presently, eh, um, there's a lot of debate about his works, uh, who wrote The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire in 1776, where he explains the rise of Christianity through natural causes, um, and then kind of blames the fall of Rome on Christianity. Again, it's something that, you know, if you want to have fun, go talk to a college professor about and see what they want to say about Gibbons. Um, and then we have Immanuel Kant, who we'll be talking about uh, later here, who wrote uh, Religion Within the Limits of Reason Alone in 1793, where he said religion as a humane force through which there can be a virtuous living. So in terms of the Enlightenment uh, and religion, a lot of Enlightenment thinkers believed humans could discover truth for themselves and were not held to religion. However, a lot of them were religious in some facet. Uh, they are still following a religion. Some Enlightenment philosophers were very tolerant of other religions, while some were not. For example, Voltaire Montesquieu uh, wrote some things that were condescending of other religions, um, while Gibbons and another philosopher, Tolland, uh, wrote positively about them. And so it's kind of a toss up in terms of what is going to be going on. So this was our first lecture on the Age of Enlightenment. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please leave them down below. And always remember to like and subscribe. Bye-bye.